Hey everyone, Patrick Kennedy here with Microchip. Today we're going to take a look at the Differential Analog to Digital Converter, or Differential ADC, with Programmable Gain Amplifier, or PGA, on the Tiny2 microcontroller family. PGAs are often used with Differential ADCs, where the Differential ADC simply measures the difference between two separate input signals. Now, Differential ADCs are great for applications such as load cells, strain gauges, thermocouples, current sensors, or pretty much any other sensor that has two output signals. This is because differential ADCs remove noise on the analog signal path, as well as common mode noise. They are also useful in improving sensor resolution, which I covered in a separate video linked below in the description. I also covered the details of the noise modes there, but as a quick reminder, common mode noise is noise present on the power rails and the reference ground, which will cancel out since the noise on both ends will be equal. Noise on the analog signal path that propagates to the input signal lines will similarly cancel out when using a differential ADC, provided that we are using a standard differential signaled sensor output in the form of a twisted pair of wires since, once again, the noise on both of those inputs will be equal. But what happens if the difference between the two input signals end up being quite small? Well, these sensors I mentioned previously are actually notorious for this, and will result in outputs well into the millivolt range. So how do we solve for this? Well, if the sensor is used in environments with a lot of electrical noise, then that noise can easily be much greater than the sensor signal itself. This is where the PGA comes into play, as it can be set to amplify the signal before the signal is sampled by the ADC. Performing this sort of signal conditioning on chip provides an elegant solution for reducing system size and cost. It also means that you can add a bunch of other functions to your system in the future as you want to add more features. Okay, so now that we have some context for why PGAs and differential ADCs are used together and what problems they solve, let's take a deeper dive into the inner workings of the PGA on the Tiny2 MCU family. If you're more curious about the differential side of things, check out the links in the description below that provide a bit more detailed comparison to single-ended ADCs. Okay, so going back to PGAs, as I said before, a PGA is a programmable gain amplifier, which as its name suggests, is simply an amplifier with gain levels that can be set by the user in firmware. The PGA in the Tiny2 family has gain settings ranging from 1 to 16 and can be used in all ADC operational modes, which I'll cover later on in this video. Additionally, the differential signals can be routed to the ADC via the PGA or directly to the ADC itself. Now I know what you're thinking. Why, Patrick? Why on God's green earth would I use this 8-bit MCU when I could just pop in a couple of bull of integrated circuit op amps and be done with this whole business? Well, no doubt you certainly could. Microchip alone sells tons and tons and tons of op amps that you could make a PGA with. Well, beyond adding another chip to your design, it turns out implementing PGAs using op amps tends to introduce another problem called flicker noise. Formally, flicker noise, or more colloquially pink noise, is a type of electronic noise with 1 over f power spectral density. Power spectral density is the amount of energy or power per frequency interval or bin, and the significance of this inverse proportionality between energy and frequency is that doubling or halving of the frequency, or octave for those of you who love music, carries an equal amount of change in noise energy. This means that the noise increases linearly at progressively lower frequencies, causing erroneous DC measurements. At high frequencies, this comes in the form of a white noise, meaning that the spectral density is held constant with respect to frequency. This holds true over most of the op amp's frequency range. However, at low frequencies, this spectral density increases at a rate of 3 decibels per octave. In this region, the spectral density is inversely proportional to the square root of the frequency, which gives us the name 1 over f noise. The frequency at which the flicker noise starts is referred to as the corner frequency, and the lower the frequency that the flicker noise appears, the better. Now, there are some powerful but rather complex methods of accounting for this that involve things like transforming the signal coming in, uh, performing some attenuation, and even some frequency shifting, um, but now this whole op amp business has gotten really complicated and is definitely going to require some more components to deal with this issue. Well. By using a capacitive-based implementation of a PGA such as that on the Tiny2 MCU family, rather than an operational amplifier implementation, Microchip has eliminated the offset errors and minimized the flicker noise to a large extent. Now, 
this does have the caveat that it results in the output not being a continuous signal, which is not really an issue since we're using it in front of an ADC which samples the signal at a certain rate. The technique used here is called correlated double sampling, which is a type of auto zero technique and is made up of primarily two phases. Phase one, in which the PGA samples the input, and at the same time, the error of the op amp is also sampled. Note that this includes both the offset error and any other error due to noise. In phase two, the PGA amplifies the sampled signal, and at the same time, the sampled op amp error from phase one is subtracted, which cancels the offset error and minimizes the flicker noise low frequency error to a large extent. As I mentioned before, the PGA in the Tiny2 family is capacitance based. And for those of you not familiar with using capacitors, they take time to charge and discharge. So as a result, we need to consider the sampling and initialization times when using the ADC and the PGA. Some of the analog modules in the ADC are disabled between conversions and must be initialized before a conversion can take place. The limiting factor is the module with the longest initialization time. So for example, if we were using the internal temperature sensor as the input and the VDD as the reference, that would give us a 35 microsecond initialization time. However, if we were to use the one volt internal reference, then the initialization time would then be 60 microseconds. We can forgo these initialization times when we're using the low latency mode, which keeps the modules enabled between conversions, albeit at the cost of some additional power consumption. As I mentioned before, the PGA on these devices is capacitance based, which means that we need more time to sample the incoming signal for the charge to build. This will reduce the maximum sampling rate we can achieve. Fortunately, there is a way to do this with just the differential ADC not using the PGA, provided you have access to an external voltage reference and can spare another pin to take that reference. Now, I covered this more in detail in another video linked on screen and in the description if you're interested in checking that out. When the PGA is used, it is sampling continuously, and it is only placed in the hold state when the ADC is sampling the PGA. The ADC PGA sample duration depends on the ADC clock and is configured in the PGA control register. The PGA gain is configured in the same register and allows for 1, 2, 4, 8, and even 16 times gain. Okay, so before going on to the details of the PGA operation and the special function registers or SFRs associated with its use, keep in mind that the ADC and PGA are graphically configurable in both MCC and start. Within the GUI, we can set the modes, enable differential inputs, set the sample duration, configure the ADC clock, and even input channels. Now, the PGA has its own section where we can set the gain making it a far simpler exercise rather than designing a resistor network to provide the same functionality, especially when using the cogeneration tools like MCC, which generate a ready-to-go API as shown here to get you started on your application code as quickly as possible. There are three groups of operation modes when using the ADC each with two modes, resulting in a total of six operational modes. The groups are single mode, series accumulation mode, and burst accumulation. Single mode results in a single ADC conversion for each trigger with an eight or 12 bit conversion output and the result register is updated after every conversion and is identical to the sample register. Series accumulation results in one conversion per trigger with an accumulation of N samples and the result register is updated after N conversions. Burst accumulation results in a burst with n samples accumulated as fast as possible after a single trigger. The result register is updated after the n number of conversions. In both the series accumulation and burst accumulation modes, n samples is set using the sampnum bit field in the ADCN control F register. The user can select values ranging from 2 to 1024 and 2 to the x increments. So there you have it. Now you know how to handle those tricky dual output sensors to make your analog interface robust to things like flicker noise, and while keeping your design simple and small using differential ADCs and programmable gain amplifiers. You also learned a little bit about the new Tiny2 microcontroller family. Now that you're armed with some knowledge, take a deeper dive into the theory, code examples, and tutorials I link below in the description. I love some additional resources if you're looking to learn more about the ADCs with enhanced computational features like filtering and thresholding, differential inputs, or the newer Tiny2 MCU family. 
Don't forget to leave your thoughts in the comments below or like and subscribe to learn more about how to optimize your next embedded design. Thanks for watching.